<laughs> you got it. Uh, I'm going to ask the first question, and I'm going to make a comment. There's no doubt that anybody with an incurable disease will eventually, if they're smart, try to find a way around it rather than accept the status quo. No question. So I understand that, and I get those letters all the time, and we've been involved in that even in trials. So the question that comes up is, how do you find evidence that something is safe? And Michael went through his, his journey to find evidence and found no published record of a problem coming from uh, mesenchymal stromal cell therapy derived from adipose at least. But when you are in an IRB, associated trial, or an FDA, they keep track of all the patients, not the anecdotal results. Uh, I'm willing to bet, but I can't say for sure, that the practitioners that we were talking about actually have surveys of their patients every year. I don't think they will, but it's possible to find that out if they even know who the patients are. I know anecdotally <coughs> one of the patients who had a pulmonary embolism who did not want to report the doctor, felt such faith in the doctor who gave this transplant, so there, I know of N of 1 at least, with a pulmonary embolism from such a therapy. So the point I'm trying to make, not in opposition to you, is to say that however these studies are done, Everybody should have access to the objective results of the studies. And not just some patients who agree to have give anecdotes or celebrities, but all of the patients. Do you want to respond to that? Sure. sure. What I don't understand, and it's, it's interesting too, as a scientist that you're using an antidote though. So, but uh, that's all right. That's okay. I, yeah. I'll, I'll, I, I'll, 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 I know. I know. Um, when I look at the, uh, the, when I talked about the 66 completed trials, those were clinical trials that were, that were, had IRBs and were published and there was no adverse conditions. So as far as, as a patient I look at it, and, is, and I think I, I, I heard our, our, our guest on the big screen say is that if safety is already proven, then it's up to, it should be at the patient's discretion whether he wants to accept the efficacy uh, risk. To me, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it might only be anecdotal at this point, but if the safety's been proven, I don't understand why this hasn't become a standard treatment in, in this country. Okay, let me Go say two, two things. Uh, the first is I don't know that I want to be understood as saying if safety is proven, uh, efficacy, no big deal. Um, I just think it's a question, you know, so I should, full disclosure, I uh, represented the DOJ back in the day in Abigail Alliance, which was about trying to get access to safe but not yet shown to be effective drugs that were experimental for terminally ill patients. And I do think that there are serious ethical concerns with the progression of clinical trial knowledge and the approval of drugs that are related to efficacy that would be problematic if you could get access to these things as an end run around. But that, but that being said, I think the bigger question to me is, to the gentleman, to our patient, your experience, right? Where would I go to learn about your experience? Do you know if your doctor has published a clinical trial about your experience? And if someone else got the exact same thing as you and had an adverse event, in the U.S., I would know where to look for that. It would be an adverse event report. The IRB would have to see it reported. Um, I know nothing one way or the other about whether the particular doctor you went to see does that or doesn't do that, uh, and that scares me, to be honest. Could we, uh, I'm just going to comment there. I don't disagree. They, if, if it was here in the United States, if we weren't chasing uh, creating this stem cell tourism industry, then it would be regulated to the point where we'd have the uh, results. Okay. John? Focusing a lot on trying to prevent, you know, you and others going to clinics that have, you know, not the proper, at least what we believe to be the proper way of data collection, and what the denominator is in terms of what the risks are. 
I think it's probably true that the risk with mesenchymal stem cell therapies is probably quite low. Even though your doctor may not have collected it, we have other ongoing clinical trials which show it's fairly safe. There are isolated events that can occur. So for example, when I make mesenchymal stem cells for my individual patients, just like you, as part of a clinical trial, I can tell you that there are some products I don't give because I created cytogenetic abnormalities in the culture period. So that may not be one that you would like to get, and if it occurs in my own lab, I can imagine it occurs in other labs as well. Secondly, there's also immune reactions that occur to it that create, could create more problems that don't necessarily occur very frequently. But really, I want to get back to the other aspect of this, which I think you were going, at least I thought you were going, Len, was in the direction of, you know, how can we create a, a situation in the United States where people don't want to go to other clinics that we don't think are the right clinics? And maybe we should be focusing our efforts in that, that way. We know the public wants these therapies. And if they are indeed relatively safe therapies as an autologous cell situation, how can we get it so that those patients are coming to the clinics in the United States where data is collected properly and then being able to move forward with that so that we don't have to address all these other issues? So it's something that we have to think so about. So I think that's and you said, you said right. That. Let me just sort of again reframe it slightly. Is that I think a two-pronged strategy. So in terms of what goes on outside the U.S., it will continue to go on outside the U.S., even if we develop a good pathway for doing this work in the U.S. So I still think we need to address that, and that's things like patient information, that's things like fraud charges, that's things like monitoring with pediatric patients what's going on, and that's things like giving incentives for private and quasi-public regulators to accredit best practices abroad. But I think that... Alongside that, we also want to think seriously about what the optimal clinical pathway is in the United States for getting more of this research done here. And my own sense is that it's not the small molecule pathway, that it's just not a good fit for stem cells. And when I think about what a better fit might be, it may be something like surgery. Uh, getting approval for each individual trial is whether or not you can actually accredit a stem cell clinic so that they you know that they exactly. have, I think that's so that they can actually have multiple therapies, multiple diseases, but you're saying that I give you the approval because I know what the process is by which you move those cell therapies forward. Exactly. IRB, what is the internal process? And again, one thing that's difficult here is I have my ideal world about what I think the regulation should look like at the end of the day. If I said today that every foreign clinic has to do that, I would get no taker. So my sense is that you need to introduce something in terms of accreditation, in terms of approval, that has an attainable bar, maybe the middle of where you want to end up. And over time, once you get buy-in, you should be increasing the standards in terms of what you're demanding as the regulatory matter. So I'll just come in with a short comment before Alta. Um, I think it's important that everybody understands that an IRB needs to be independent because they are the data safety monitoring group. And so they can't be totally aligned with the interests of the doctor or the person who's promulgating the trial or the company that's paying for the trial. But also, they don't judge efficacy. They only judge safety and only during the trial. So it is not a regulatory body. It is a safety body to ensure that the medical care during the treatment, you, you'll fix me then. <laughs> but it's the regulatory body like the FDA that then oversees whether it's efficacious as well as safe. Now, Alta will uh, change your mind. Yeah, I'm always telling Irv what you should think. I know. Um, <laughs> for, I think, Irv, it's possible that you're talking about a data safety monitoring board and not an IRB. Because an IRB looks specifically at whether the benefits are reasonable in relation to the risks, as well as looking at the methods of recruitment to make sure things are voluntary and informed. So they do, do they do that before, or do they make a judgment after no, the trial? They do that before the trial right. Begins. Oh no, no, that's I agree with that. They look at prospective benefits based on the evidence that you have leading into it. And prospective risks. And during sure. the course of the trial, could be an IRB or it could be a DSMD. 
that's looking at the actual right. accrual of data, but the data that they're accruing on adverse events to a DSMV with an IRB, they'll probably also be getting some Right, but they don't evidence. make the final judgment like an FDA that it was both safe and efficacious. They don't make a final judgment about either safety or efficacy, they, okay. right? So they, that's, but if I may, what I really wanted to do was ask a question to Mr. Fallon. First, to thank you, I thought it was a really helpful and informative uh, presentation uh, building off of one person's experience. You talked a lot about credibility and the things that undermine the credibility of various parties that are in this kind of circle. Uh, you talked about some of the concerns that were raised when you thought that there were commercial conflicts of interest or at least uh, influences on people. Uh, and obviously, uh, in addition to the ones that you were concerned about because you had identified government and pharma and patent holders, the companies that are offering these kinds of interventions have their own commercial interests. Academic researchers have their careers, even if it's not financial, it's a uh, you know, kind of ambition, ambition-wide uh, kind of a conflict of interest. So can you help us understand, within the universe of possibilities, what you would find to be the most credible sources of information on what actually is safe and what actually is effective based on their evaluation of the information we have today or based on recommendations on how to get that information? Certainly. You know, I, as I said before, I don't believe in conspiracy theories, and I don't, I just, I do know there's always a financial um, aspect. And I heard earlier that, you know, people uh, in this group were saying that, you know, there's these greedy, money-oriented clinics. Some of them, I'm sure, are malfeasance and are all, you know, guys who are, but I think there's a group of them, and I'd love to see some accreditation on them to, to see which one was uh, following uh, some, you know, had proper lab procedures and had, uh, you know, I, I checked into that as much as I could, but I'm a civilian as opposed to a professional. So I'd love to see some, uh, some oversight or some uh, accreditation as, as, as we, we heard earlier. But who do you, do, who do you trust when you're a, a, a patient who has a disease? I mean, there's just a lot of information. Like for instance, I heard people in the group here are probably not happy with what Arnold Kaplan's saying or um, Sir Gordon, um, but you have to depend on, on you know, what, what you see out there. And I looked at it and said, okay, there's 66 completed clinical trials. So in my mind, I read that there wasn't one adverse, I trusted that. I, I showed it to my physician and he goes, well, you make a point. So when we heard about, you know, what your, uh, you know, my physicians said, you know what, we don't approve of this, we don't, we don't advocate it, but we can understand why you'd want to do this. And it, from what you're showing me, it looks like it's safe. It, it, just a very brief follow-up. Sure. Because it's really helpful since we're looking at how it is that we can help enhance the quality of the patient experience within this universe of phenomena, right? So you've, you've talked about the value of seeing 66 clinical trials. So one question is, how much did you then want to go behind that and ask who was running the trials, what were their methodologies, what were their conflicts, et cetera? Wait, wait, and the second is, in the other parts of the universe we haven't talked about, medical societies that represent like the group of surgeons or the group of oncologists or academies like the National Academy of Sciences, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. You know, how much are these players capable of becoming sources of credible information for you? Well, I, th I think the, the answer is, you know, as a non-scientist, as a non-physician, as I read the trials, I would go always to the end and say results. And if there were some positive results and there was safety, I said, okay, that's, that's credible. And I felt, I personally felt better. So what can a, can a, a organization or an entity, a regulatory body do to help that? I'm not sure. I mean, it's nice to see that these clinical trials exist and maybe there was a way to organize these and present them to patients. Uh, and a lot of what I heard today, for instance, was the fear and all the things that went wrong. I didn't hear anybody talk about what did they collect from these offshore clinics that went right? Is somebody collecting that? Uh, I'd like to hear something balanced. Hello. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I think that um, we could keep this conversation going on for the entire afternoon. We can't, so I'm going to be extremely brief. But there are a few points that I would like to make. Um, well, first of all, how many patients have been treated with MSCs and show that it's a safe treatment? The correct answer, to the best of my knowledge, is 
we don't know. Because we do know that there is an inordinate number of trials and MSCs, and we also do know that 65% of all clinical trials across the board, also outside of the boundaries of stem cell therapies, are never reported. And we know there is a very interesting editorial in the BMJ a couple of weeks ago, and we know that selectively the trials that don't get ever reported are those with results that don't fit the hypothesis. And we have absolutely no tool to determine in those trials what is the percentage or the incidence of adverse events. Conversely, we do know from fragmentary information as much as you want that, for example, adverse effects with MSCs have been reported. There are cases of fatal encephalomyelitis that appear, as a matter of fact, to <coughs> happen specifically when MSCs are given to patients with some problem in their immune system. So all this is just information in development, and I'm not here to say that it is unsafe, but I would be extremely cautious in endorsing the statement that it's shown that it is safe. Second, you made the point that people who want to regulate autologous <coughs> stem cell treatments are those people who want patents from mass drugs, from allogeneic things. Well, autologous treatments are regularly patented. I mean, autologous chondrocytes were patented, autologous skin grafts are patented, autologous corneal transplant made of stem cells are transplanted. But the point that is most interesting to me is that you say, and I can, as a physician, not as a scientist. As a physician, I can understand your point entirely. But as a scientist, I must ask you of doing one effort. And that effort is to recognize that you have, obviously, the intellectual resources that are needed to do that. That every patient, when judging about science and medicine, has an unavoidable bias. And your bias is precisely your wish to be treated, improved, or cured. So the bias is okay, but that applies to oneself. It's not okay when it applies to an external object, be it a natural object or another group of patients. So your key point is, it's my cells. And because it is my cells, nobody has the right to arbitrate what I do with it in a medical procedure. There are two things here. First, how do we know, as you seem to think, that that is a medical procedure to begin with? And second, are we sure that because it is your cells, you can do with those cells whatever you want? And number three, is your right the one that you think exists? Something that exists independent of the existence of another individual who is your doctor, who is actually claiming his own right to treat you. Because the obvious example is, your doctor believes that treating you with MSCs is a medical procedure. And I, who, I mean, I am a practicing physician, okay? I don't think that that is the case. So, if your right existed independent of the existence of somebody else's right to sell you a treatment, then you could come to me and say, the standard care is that you treat me with MSCs. And if you don't do that, I'm going to sue you, right? The reason that you cannot do it is because there is no general consensus in the medical community that what you refer to as a medical procedure is actually a medical procedure. It's not. So if it is not, let me finish the argument, and then, and then I'll stop. Okay. I'm on point if four. If it is not a medical procedure, then 
What about your right of doing everything you want to in your states? Because the scales in my hands are unquestionably mine. And this morning I woke up with a distinct idea that those scales in their hands I don't want to live with anymore. So I go to my doctor and claim that because it's my scales, and because you're a doctor, in particular you're a surgeon, I want you, um, you to amputate my hands because that is my right. So if I'm, I know that this may seem too paradoxically, and this is why I asked you beforehand to make an effort and see the big picture beyond the boundaries of your own interest and your own definite bias and the bias of the doctor wants to treat you. Do you know what? Michael, I, will, I will agree. Could, could I just? Uh, sure. We're over time for this session, and I've been threatened with. Can I make a short response? A or? very short response, okay. or okay. a private response, as long as, as I, his. Mine will response. be really short, in that I can recognize the bias. And I recognize that there is a uh, disagreement among, among scientists and physicians whether this is a medical procedure or not. But as a patient, uh, I, you know, I, I think I, I do deserve to have the, uh, if, if it's available and it's, it's safe. I, have, I should have the right to my own body. Um, but I also, re in recognizing the bias, also recognize that there are always turf wars. And when I look at this as an outsider, I see turf wars. I see turf wars between scientists and physicians, mm -hmm. and that shouldn't affect me or, or my rights. I mean, people are defending that we have the right to decide what I should be doing or what my loved one should be doing with their body. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all the speakers, including those of us who didn't keep to time, uh, and especially Michael, who came into this den of lambs.